Okay, Jeff, what are you doing? What do you think I'm doing? Pastor Todd about the gates of reality. I'm trying to see what the reality is in here. And what the difference is in the reality out here. Okay. The title of my message this morning is The Gates of Reality. And uh, kind of a strange title, but it, it, God has showed me some things I want to share with you this morning. I shared with some of the leadership, and they thought it was pretty good. So um, I guess we'll, you know, we'll get into, into the Word this morning. I've got a, several scriptures I want to go to. Uh, first one will be in, in Genesis 28, and then I'll be going over to Matthew 16. And, of course, uh, you know, different ones I'll, I'll announce. But... Um, I was, I kind of stumbled on this, but what happened was, it just, uh, I got the word gates in my, in my head, and I was, so I was praying about it, and I'm looking through the scriptures of all the uh, scriptures that mention the word gate. That seems kind of, you know, uh, mundane or whatever, but the fact is, I noticed that things that are called gates weren't really gates. They weren't physical gates, is what I'm talking about. But the gates that they were mentioning were kind of like an allegory type of gates. So that's what I was really interested in. I'm not talking really about physical gates. Um, a few years back, it was, it's been a few years now, um, one, of the, one of the times I went to, went to uh, Jerusalem uh, when I was in Israel, and I forget when it was. But anyway, we, um, we met up with, we, we knew the fellow from before, uh, by the name of Shemal. He was a, a, a tour guide around Jerusalem. And I was interested in doing what he called a walking tour around the city walls of Jerusalem. That's the old city of Jerusalem. Not the, <laughs> Jerusalem is spread out now, but I mean the old city. And actually do a walking tour. And I asked the, I says, she wants to, what's, what's there to see in a walking tour on the outside of the old ancient walls of Jerusalem? He said, well, he says, uh, have you had any interest in the gates? He said, there's significance in the gates around Jerusalem. Hmm. Sounded interesting. I said, yeah, let's go ahead and make a tour and begin to talk about it. Yeah, so I'm interested in one particular gate. I said, can you take us to one particular gate? He said, which one would that be? I said, the Golden Gate. Now, if you're not, if you're not familiar with the t titles and names of the gates, there's about eight of them left today around the old city of Jerusalem. Over the years, it has changed. For anywhere from the number 12 during Nehemiah's time, when Nehemiah rebuilt the walls, there was 10 gates. Today, I think there's about eight gates that you can go through. But the Golden Gate is interesting because basically that was the gate that Jesus came through. Now, if you remember your history uh, back when, in, during the, the Crusades, when the uh, Crusaders were in Jerusalem, and, and of course uh, the Arabs, Saladin was one of the leaders, Muslim uh, Arabs were, were attacking the Crusaders, and they actually lost the city of Jerusalem to Saladin. That's where the, the Dome of the Rock was built, and he began to restructure all of Israel to look more like a Muslim community than it was a Jewish community. But anyway, so he did that. But what he did, he heard of, he heard of a folklore that he calls a folklore. <laughs> we know it to be true. But he, of a Jewish Messiah that would come through the Golden Gate into Jerusalem. So what he did, he blocked it up. He blocked it up as if it couldn't happen. The only problem was he was a few hundred years too late uh, because basically Jesus had already come through the gate. And we know, we know, so that was the Golden Gate. Uh, it comes off the Mount of Olives and goes into the city of Jerusalem. That would have been the most direct path from uh, where he, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, to go into the uh, gates of Jerusalem. So Saladin, he did something else. And this was interesting. He did something else. He took and he made in front of the gate, the Golden Gate, he made it into a graveyard. So any any. Muslim that died at that time, he put him in the ground, and that's where they buried him. Uh, because he heard of another folklore, though he, as he says, that uh, a Jewish Messiah or a Jewish prophet would never walk on the tops of graves. That's what he heard. This is what he, what he believed. So, he, so, in other words, anything to keep the Messiah from coming through that gate. There's only one problem with, that, with what he heard. And that may be true with a Jewish grave. But that's not necessarily true with a Muslim grave. <laughs> but anyways, let Saladin be what, be what he was, uh, you know, in the, a figure in the, in the thing of history. But uh, I, had, I got that word stuck in my head about gates, but not physical gates. Uh, I mean, it's not going to be about physical gates today, but more about what, what gates are and what he meant by it. Genesis 28, if you want to turn there if you're in your Bible, is a story about Jacob. I remember Jacob. Jacob was an interesting fellow any way you look at it. 
I mean, how he got his birthright, and so on and so forth, back and forth. I can, that's, that, Jacob is, is a several series of sermons just in itself, so we'll just leave that go as it is. But he had this one particular vision, if you remember it, in uh, Genesis chapter uh, 17. Now, you can remember how Jacob got where he was. This is, let me give you a little bit of flashback. Jacob uh, basically was a twin. He had a twin brother named Esau. And, and what it was is they were both born from Rebekah. They are both born at the same time. Uh, so except the first one that comes out first and born becomes technically the oldest son. And this was, it was re recorded that Jacob came out holding on to the ankle <laughs> of Esau, if you remember the story. And that's how he was born. And from that point on, well, Rebecca favored, um, uh, favored uh, um, uh, Jacob, not Esau, for whatever reason. She always felt like, oh, God has called this boy. But anyway, anyway. and now if you, if, you, if you look at Esau and his character, I can see where God would switch the blessing. I really can. Because this man was a man of no character. Matter of fact, he was willing to sell his birthright uh, uh, to um, his brother for a bowl of soup. So, in other words, his physical needs at the time, uh, for that day or whatever, his physical needs meant more to him than the future blessings of future generations. See, when we, when we carry on the Word of God, we carry on the purpose of God, we're not just talking about ourselves. It's not, it's, it's not about our convenience, all, 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 totally. What it's about is what we're doing is training in the next generation and passing a legacy on to the next generation. Now, I've been a, a minister in Key West for the last 30, 31 years or so. Uh, my wife and I have been married 50 years. But if you did a, a, a legacy of me, of, you know, if, from going, going on to heaven, do a legacy of me, what am I going to be known for? Well, to my family, I'm going to be known as a, as a husband to one woman, ever married one woman for 50 years or hopefully longer than, <laughs> yeah, that's where we're at right now. But, uh, it, but also that I was a pastor that pioneered this work here in Key West and, and, and been here for 31 years and we built, like, and that becomes part of the legacy. Well, then people say, well, what did he believe? You know, and you start talking about this stuff. And then the Lord comes in, and then and the gospel being preached. Uh, uh, five different continents that I've, that I've personally preached on in different, you know, so many different countries that we've been to uh, uh, in preaching the gospel. That will be the legacy that comes up. When you talk about the legacy of Jacob, here's one thing that stands out about Jacob I like about him. He never quit. Amen. Say what you want about Jacob, but he was ten tenacious. In a vision, he wrestled with, 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 with a, a, you know, God set him up with an opponent to wrestle, and, and, he, and he wouldn't give up. He wouldn't quit. Even when the, the angel touched his, his hip out of joint, he still, he wouldn't quit. He kept on fighting, kept on fighting. And th this is the legacy that Jacob was laying for himself, and this was going to be uh, one of the third of the mention of the uh, legacy of the Abrahamic covenant. Imagine that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is now the covenant can you imagine Abraham, Isaac, and Esau? But Esau, however, his descendants were, Ed were, from, were the Edomites, and the Edomites were sworn enemies of Israel. Still, you know, had been, they're, no longer exist they're no longer in existence where God's word came through Jacob that you're going to uh, have many descendants, many, many, many descendants, and the descendants of Jacob are still going on. Uh, Israel is a response, because Jacob's name was later changed to Israel, and we're still talking about Israel. It's the name of a country. Uh, so, so this is the legacy that's going on. So God did favor uh, Jacob over Esau in this thing. However, he got it from, uh, got the, the birthright. So say what you want about the birthright. It was still orchestrated of God. God tested this guy and, and tested him and tested him. In this one vision I'm going to talk about this morning, he talks about uh, in G Genesis 28, verse 17, he, say, he says uh, that he saw this vision. What he saw, we call it Jacob's ladder. I mean, you've seen anything. And what he saw in the vision, when he saw, when he went to sleep, he saw a vision. He saw a ladder extending from earth to heaven. And what he saw in the ladder were the angels passing back and forth, up and down, from heaven to earth. In other words, he saw a connection. Okay? When he woke up from the dream, of course, he had a rock. He took a rock and he laid it out for a pillow. And that's what he fell asleep on, a rock. I don't know about you, but... I got a my pillow, you know, the comfort foam, and I've got a I've got a memory foam mattress, and I don't want to ever have forget. 
My memory phone, anyway, uh, memory, you know, but he, for, him, for Jacob, a rock was good enough. I mean, he had a rock for a pillow. So when he woke up with his dream, he said, he said, this rock, he said, this place. He said, he woke up in verse 17, he said, I was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? He said, and this is none other than the house of God. And listen to this, the gate of heaven. There's no gate in there. There's no gate, physical gate that he's seeing. He's seeing this in a vision. But he mentioned the house of God and the gate of heaven. That's the thing he mentioned. Now, gate singular. So then he took this stone that he had for a pillow, and he set that as a pillar. And he said, this is the gate of heaven, or this, this is the house of God. It's a rock. We think of the house of God as a building like this, and, and you decorate, you come, people come and they worship. God. No, 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 this was a rock. This was, he said, this is the house of God, this place right here. Matter of fact, he changed the name of the town. There was a town there. The, the town's uh, original name was Luz, L-U-Z, Luz. And, but he changed the name of that town to Bethel. So what's the significance of that? Well, understand that in Hebrew, names mean something. We're going to cover some of these things this morning. That names have a meaning. So what he was saying, he was saying, he's saying, no, he said, this is Bethel, no longer lose, but Bethel. Bethel, Beth in Hebrew means house. Beth El means house of God. So basically, he named the whole area. This is the house of God. And he's saying the house of God is the gates of heaven. The house of God is the gates of heaven. So I, 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 was, I went to bed when I think about that. I was just meditating on the scripture, and all of a sudden, it, it just dawned on me, and I woke up. And I flashed back to Matthew chapter 16. Are you, are you ready? Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, don't get mixed up. This is, I'm going to tie these things together. Just you know, stay with me. Uh, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, Jesus knew who he was. But who are people saying that I am? Now, we could do the same thing today. We can go down to town Key West and just take a poll and say, uh, who is Jesus? Uh, who do you say that he is? Some will say, well, he was a good man. He was this, he was that. Let me tell you something. If Jesus was anything other than who he says he was, he'd be a liar. And Jesus is not a liar. He said he was the Son of God. He is the Messiah, and that's exactly who he is. He is not a good man. Because if he was just a good man, he would still fall short from what God has called him to be. So Jesus Christ is exactly who Jesus Christ says he is. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So he said, so he's asking his disciples, when he said to them, he says, he says, he, he said, some said that they are John the Baptist. My the ones I'm gonna mention are already dead. This was after John the Baptist already died. He says, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah. All dead. In other words, they're saying Jesus was reincarnated or came back as one of these other people. What a messed up belief system. <laughs> but anyway, that's what they're saying. And the disciples are just reporting what Jesus asked for. So they're, they're, so they're, they're not saying that's what we say. They're not saying what's what the other people say. But he saith unto him, but who do you say that? Now we're getting back down. Okay, what do you guys say? And Simon, and Simon Peter answers, and he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, son of Barjona, for flesh and blood, in other words, people, person, did not reveal this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Interesting. You all know that story, okay? It's the next thing that he says that got me back to this message. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock... I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, you notice the word gates in your, in, in your Bible is plural, not singular. Now, are we talking about physical gates? I mean, you woke up this morning, and the devil's hounding you about something because you're, getting on, way to go, you're on your way to go to church. Okay, did, you, did he take a gate and beat you over the head with it? A physical gate and hit you with a piece of lumber? No, no, but yet we call it gates. So what is the significance of gates? He said, he said, Thou appear on a rock, I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever shall loose be on earth also loose in heaven. So basically he's saying, what is the gate? What is the big thing about the gates? And this is what I want to know. And this is what bugged me all week. <laughs> what is about the gates? And it, it dawned on me. You ever had anything dawn on you? 
Okay, well, I'm getting older now, and lots of things like to dawn on me. But anyway, it dawned on me. A gate. I have a gate in the backyard. I just taught, shared with you. I went to a gate tour, a walking tour in Jerusalem, all of all the gates. I have a gate in my backyard. And if I go to my gate, there's two big wooden gates made out of cedar. They're painted, but they're made out of cedar. And there's two big concrete columns in the ground. And if I open those gates and walk out, I walk from my property, okay, onto the city streets, city of Key West. So basically, from my gate, I cross over the threshold, I'm in another reality. Amen. Okay, so basically what happens, a gate becomes something that goes from one reality to another reality. Here's a reality. Well, standing on this side of the gate, my gate is there, the street is there, I'm on this side of the gate. The reality is my property, my yard that I let my wife mow every week. I help her, I mean, anyway, but, but this, this, this is, this is that, the reality, okay? If I want to, by law, I can stop people from crossing that gate because this is my property, that would be trespassing and that's against our law. So we have laws that protect this reality on this side. However, when I step over this way, I step in another entirely different reality. This is public street. I don't have the same rights here that I have here legally. Are you with me so far? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm laying a foundation here. So, was, but the, the, so basically, this is what, so from here, one reality, open the gate, step out, another reality. If I'm here in this reality, this is my reality. This is, what, this is my yard. This is my place. This is my little kingdom. <laughs> a corner lot or flag on 18th Street. This is my little kingdom. It's right here. You know? But when I step out, no, now is another reality. We got Key West. It is a city, Key West. Cars can drive by. People can walk right along that. I, I can step out of my gate and people can walk right past me. And I cannot, uh, I mean, it's legally they can walk right, right past me because it's a different reality. So I put this, I saw gates is, is, is going from one reality to another. Let's put this back into the spiritual uh, significance of this. Jacob said, he said, this rock, this Bethel rock, this is the house of God, the gates of heaven. In other words, here, in this spot, I saw another reality. Amen. Now, reality, not fantasy, not a vision, a reality, because he used the word gates. So the word gate would depict another reality. Can I go back to what Jesus said in this whole thing? Upon this rock, here he goes with the rock again, he connected I don't know if, it, if you see this before, but he connected Jacob's rock with this rock. Now, Peter wasn't a rock. We're not, we're not talking about stones here. Jacob's was a physical rock. But it was a physical rock that represented the house of the Lord. It wasn't a house, it was a rock. Even in Jacob's time, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a house, it's a rock. So it was a marker of significance and covenant they did that. Okay, but Jesus said, no. He said, upon this rock, Peter's not a rock. You, okay, you play with the name Peter, Petra. Petra means rock. And, 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 and of course, Petra means, uh, Peter's name means little rock. And Jesus is the big rock. It's still, any way you look at it, it's still allegorical, not physical. Nobody hit Peter in the head with a rock. We don't think. I mean, it's not recorded, but I mean, so, but, but it's not a physical rock. But he said, the revelation that Peter got that wasn't from man, that was from heaven, was sent from God. It came from God. He said, upon this rock, this revelation that came from God, I will build my church. If you are looking for Jesus and you want to find Jesus, it's very simple. Look at Matthew chapter 16. You will find Jesus building his church. Amen. Not building your little kingdom. Amen. Building your church building his church the way he wants it, the way he has commanded it, the way he wants it built. Amen, Pastor. Hallelujah. I just slipped that in there. Do you know how, how I did that? I'm a professional. Won't try this at home. But I slipped that in the conference. <laughs> anyway, praise the Lord. I got thinking about it. But in this particular part, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates, plural, gates, the realities, can I, use, can I use that word? The realities of hell. Now, it's a real place. These are realities. These aren't fantasies. These are realities. The realities of hell will not come against what God has built upon this rock. That tells me they're going to try. 
So what Satan bombards us with is not fantasy. This is not a, a devil dressed in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork. That's cartoons. That's not reality. The reality is it's going to be realities of hell. Now, more than one. Why? Because he'll use whatever reality he can that appeal to you in a temptation. We'll get into that in a minute, too. Praise the Lord. He'll use any reality that he can. But he's using realities, not fantasies, realities. But Jesus said the realities that he comes up with and the realities he's going to bombard the church with is not going to penetrate. It is not going to prevail. It is not going to overrule. It is not going to change my church, my vision, everything I've got. When I'm building this church, Jesus said, the gates of hell, the realities of hell, no matter how much it tries. See, there's only one gate that Jacob mentions to heaven. There's only one reality. <clears throat> Heaven is one reality. It takes in everything that overrules every other reality. Amen. Satan has several realities because he don't know what will work. And a temptation that comes against you as a Christian or believer is a reality. It's a real thing. It's a real desire. It can be a real downfall. It can be a real sin. It can be re That's real. So we are talking about reality. But the gates of hell will not prevail. They could try, but they won't prevail. Amen. Are we learning anything so far? Yeah. Praise the Lord. I, I got that in the middle of the night. I woke up, almost shouted, but I couldn't. I would wake up with Diane. I mean, I, I, saw, I never saw this before. Jesus connected Jacob's vision with Peter's revelation to declare that the gates of hell. See, what happens is Satan is not a creator, but he is a great imitator and also a perverter. So he's taken what God has created in that reality and he's perverted it for his own benefit. Hmm. So he's presenting gates just like God has presented the gate to heaven. He's presenting gates to try to trap, confuse, and try to uh, allure his victims. I'll put it that way. Hmm. Praise the Lord. Did I share what Luz means and what Bethel means? Bethel means the house of God. Did I share that? Luz means, I didn't get to that part, separation and departure. That's what the word means. That's what the, when, the, when Jacob changed the name of the town, it went from separation and departure to the house of God. Oh, we had the time, I'm telling you. It's, it's right. I, I, I love the Hebrew. You go back to, 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 the, uh, to the Old Testament, and you take the Hebrew names. Every Hebrew name has a meaning. And I have a book. I have a couple of books, several books. You can, you can do this online. But, but I always uh, check the name. What does the name mean? And this name in the Bible, is, it's an English translation is L-U-Z, lose, means a separation and departure. So what happened was Jacob, by the power of the covenant, he could use his words in his pillow <laughs> and declare with the power of God backing him that this is now Bethel. Beth-el, house, the house of Elohim. The house, I would put it, fill in the word, God has several names, but there's only one God. Okay, but he said Beth-el, or the house of God. Uh, it's like, how many ever say hallelujah? How many ever said hallelujah? Every country I've ever been in, it's, it's still hallelujah. I love it when the world uses it and doesn't know what it means. Well, hallelujah. You know, it, when something good happens, we say, well, hallelujah. What they're actually saying is it's a Hebrew word. Okay? Hallelujah means praise be. Yah is short for Yahweh, which means praise be the God. Yeah. So whenever you hear somebody in the world say, hallelujah, they say, yes, amen, brother, praise be to God. <laughs> That's exactly what it means. So I like to look up the names of different things and, and put it into the story. Because what he did, he, he, he took the separation away. In other words, the house of God replaced the separation and a place of departure. He, he replaced the separation. There is no more separation. Through Jesus Christ, we have no more separation with the Father. This is thousands of years prior. 
Did you ever look at the lineage and how, well, look at, I mentioned Jacob and how he got their birthright, but did you ever realize that God is mapping from the time of Abraham all the way to the time of Christ? Because what, was, what mattered, what, what was in Jesus' lineage? So God was mapping the whole thing in, in the covenant from Abraham on. He's mapping because all these figures are in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ had to be born out of the house of David. That was a must. Otherwise, you couldn't be claim, claimed to be the Messiah. House of David. So David's in his lineage. So is, so is Rahab. <laughs> the, the, the hooker in, 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 uh, in Jericho is in the lineage of Jesus. Why? <laughs> oh, that will get religious people standing on end. Why? Because what, if you look at the lineage, Joseph, where, where, you, we had Joseph's flag back here. Joseph gave birth to Manasseh, I'm pointing to the tribal flags, you can't see my camera. But Manasseh and Ephraim, they were the sons of, of, of Joseph. Do you know what was strange about those two sons? And strange about Joseph? They had a Gentile mother. They were half Jew, half Gentile. And when Jacob, which was then called Israel, comes to bless them, he did this. In other words, the right hand is a stronger blessing than the left hand. Joseph put his both sons, Manasseh being the oldest, on Jacob's right. And his son Ephraim on Jacob's left, or Israel's left. And he said, now, they're here for the blessing. This is what's going to carry on to the covenants. There was 12 sons that Jacob had. He blessed each one of them. If you look at our... Uh, uh, flags that we have hanging, the, the Israel tribal flags, there's a symbol in each one which represents a prophecy that Jacob prophesied over each one of his sons. And that's what this there for, significant kind of a teaching, it reminds us. But with Manasseh and Ephraim, he did this. And Joseph said, whoa, 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 what's wrong? This is not, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, no, no, this isn't right. Manasseh's the oldest, he gets this blessing. Basically, he said what amounts to, mind your business, I know what I'm doing. God switched. Why? Fast forward to Jesus on the cross. And what God did when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? He did for us a cross handed blessing. The strongest blessing that belonged to the firstborn, which is Jesus, the firstborn of many brethren, was now switched over to the Gentile, us. And it was symbolized right from the old covenant. Now that's another that's another sermon for another time. I've I'm, I've, I've preached that. Anyway, let's let's go on. Going back to the gate. So here we come. Fast forward. Uh, here's Peter. Uh, Peter again. Okay. Day of Pentecost has come and gone. This is after the Pentecost. The very first miracle recorded that was done after the day of Pentecost was Peter. And Peter comes up, and he walks up to the temple. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We know that. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. This is time to go to the temple. We do our afternoon prayers or, you know, and, and worship God. And he comes up to the temple, and there's a guy who's been lame from birth. Again, never, never walked in his life. Think about that, okay? And he's begging for money, begging for alms. That's what, what was legal for him to do. That's how they, that's what was their ancient welfare system to help people that couldn't work for their own and out of the goodness of people's heart. This was also under the law of Moses that you were commanded to give to the poor, uh, uh, you know, in, in certain so, so they had a legal, he had a legal right to be there. But because of his ailment, he did not have a legal right to enter the temple. He was kept out. He wasn't allowed in church. Because not because he was a bad man, or anything, not because he, he had something wrong with him. And it was a strong belief in the Jewish culture at that time that if you had something like a lameness, blindness, or whatever, it comes from sin. Either the sin of your parents or something. But anyway, uh, you're, you're, you're not fit to come into the temple which you without uh, blame. Isn't it amazing that Jesus healed all these people? <laughs> well, here's Peter comes up to the guy and he says to me, he says, silver and gold I have none. But what I have, I'll give to you. And the Bible specifically says this. He reached out, stretched out his right hand. What's on the right hand? What I just mentioned the right hand is? The strongest of the blessings. Why? Because Jesus in heaven is sitting on the right hand of the Father. 
So he reaches out the hand of Jesus and picks up this guy, and all of a sudden he says, rise and walk. Cool story. We know the story. The guy dances around. He said, did it ever dawn on him that he never walked before? Now he's going to have to go get a job. <laughs> okay, but he, 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 he rise and uh, walk and walked in there. And the Bible says this. I'm, uh, I'm, this is Acts chapter, two, Acts chapter 3, verses 2 and 8. And it says, and it says right here, it says, and a certain man laid out by the gate called beautiful. How many like that word, beautiful? A gate beautiful. Isn't that interesting? What would, now, what would you think that means? It's lovely. Maybe laid with gold. They did that, a temple. I mean, we're talking about the temple here. Gate beautiful. I'll come back to that in a minute. But when, they, when, Jesus, when, he, when, when Peter reached out his hand and caused him to walk, in the name of Jesus of Christ on that, was rise and walk. They turned around and went through that gate, or that doorway, whatever you want to call it. It was called the gate beautiful. The gate to the temple was called the gate beautiful. <laughs> Works for me, nice looking gate. I like a nice painted gate and everything clean, looking nice around me, blue little shrubs around the gate, you know, and so it looks nice. That isn't what it means. Here's what it means. I looked it up in the Greek. This is what it means. Strong concordance, you can find it for yourself. Belonging to the right hour or season, timely flourishing. That's what that Greek word that is, transfer, that is translated in our English Bible as beautiful, that's what it means. It means that there was a right time and the right hour that he's standing in front of the right gate and the right man came along and reached out his hand and brought back the healing why does God want to heal a man like that? Why does God want to heal the blind? Why does he want to make the wither hand grow out? Why does he want to raise the dead? Why? So the body can function the way God's original plan and purpose was it to function. That is why. To restorate, for restoration and to restore that which God has put in purpose, on purpose and he has uh, planned it to be. This man was not supposed to be lame. God caused, gave him two legs. He wanted him to walk around on his own. That was God's design. That was his purpose for that man, as it is for all of us. Yes. So what happens is he stretched forth the right hand in front of the gate, beautiful, okay, and he reached up and he stood. Now he turns about face, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he's walking with Peter, and on through, the, through that gate, beautiful, because it was the right hour, it was the right season, and he now can flourish. Amen. Walking through that gate. This reality out here, I was lame. A man came along. Somebody, now I, am legally, I can legally step over into this reality called Gate Beautiful that used to be a separation from me. It's no longer a separation. Now I can flourish through the Gate Beautiful. I'm in the temple of God for the first time in my life. I'm twirling about. I'm praising because I was never allowed in here before. But with two good legs that God gave me, now I can come in. I can dance and jump. I can run around. And they had all they can do to contain this guy. So the Gate name, I guess, was significant for him. The gate beautiful became a gate longing for the right hour, the right season. I, I need the time. I want to flourish. I can't go through the flourishing gate because there's something wrong with me. I cannot flourish because there's something wrong with me. We want to lay blame, but there is no blame. Who can we lay blame to? They tell the, the Pharisees tell me it's sin in my life. I have no sin in my life, but my parents must have sinned. Somebody must have sinned. Somebody's sin put me in this place and now keeps me from flourishing in the gate beautiful. So in the Hebrew mindset, to walk through the gate, the front door of the church, or the front door of the temple, in this case, must be a place of flourishing. Hallelujah. When God brings us in the church, we won't walk through a gate. We've got two glass doors up in front of the church and walk through the church doors. I believe that when you walk across that threshold with the idea of coming into God and praising, or any church for that matter, not just this church, that's, it's not about the building. It's about a transfer of our th thoughts and our thinking process 
we go from one reality out there. This is on McDonald Avenue. So you got the reality of McDonald Avenue. Oh, that's a good one to have. No, <laughs> McDonald Avenue and step into reality. Covenant Word Church is set up here, serviced for God's purpose. Planted here by his spirit. Okay, in a, in, in a word that he gave me years ago to do his bidding, to give the people an uncompromised word of God, full gospel, word of God. This is a problem. And from that, they can flourish. I wish I had the time I could sit there and name business after business after business after business that this church has prayed for and they've flourished. Individual after individual after individual that were almost bankrupt and, and on skid row, if you want to call it that, you know, spiritually speaking, but uh, laid hands and God restored them, gave them positions and jobs that they didn't normally have before. It, it, I can't count all the people over the last 30 years that happened, but they came into the church and were part of this and they begin to flourish. I guess maybe we got gate beautiful too, huh? But we step from one reality into another reality. When Satan comes against you, he comes with a reality. Can I share something real quick? I've got, I got nine minutes and 17 seconds. Can I share this with you real quick? Okay. Philippians 4. Go to Philippians 4. I'm going to start reading in verse 4. Go ahead and turn as, I get, as we get there. We read it together. But I want to give you this before I run completely out of time because this is going to seal the whole message for you. <clears throat> Philippians 4, I'll read in verse 4, says this. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Paul is writing this. Uh, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Paul wrote this epistle. If you got this down, peace, peace, don't be anxious, peace. He wrote this while he was in a Roman prison. Anxiousness and is see in the world, peace is the opposite of something. In other words, if we can get quiet, we can get peace. If we can get free of our problems, we can get peace. But in the kingdom, it's not about uh, it's not about what's missing. Peace becomes the person, the person of Jesus. Jesus doesn't need to give you peace; he is peace. So when we need, and in the middle of turmoil whether it's a Roman prison or whatever, in the middle of turmoil, the peace of God, we can still have the peace of God, but he shows up as a person. So we dedicate ourselves to that person, and we dedicate ourselves to that person through prayer. That's one, one of the things. I'm, just, I'm going to focus in on that for a minute. James said this in James chapter 4, verse 2. He says, you have not because you ask not. That's a system of prayerlessness. Prayerlessness will cause lack. Jesus said in Mark chapter 14, he said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Least be, he said, the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. In other words, watch and pray. When there's an absent or a prayerlessness, what happens? Temptation comes. Even if you resist the temptation and don't fall into it, you just encountered a temptation that you men and I had to go through had you been praying. Now, can I get back to the gates to tie it together? Satan comes with these gates of opportunity for one reality to another. Jesus says when you pray and ask, he says another reality happens. And that reality takes over. We fight spiritual battles, not all the time because we will fight spiritual battles, but we will always fight spiritual battles. But how many battles do we fight that are generated from our prayerlessness. Even if we win, how many are we fighting that maybe we never would have had to go through had we had a a prayer-filled life? I can go on and on. I'm I'm running out of time, but I can go on and on about how Jesus uh, did this and and how, you know, he he stated this in scriptures. You have not because you ask not. Watch and pray. At least you enter into temptation. Okay, enter in temptation is one thing. Temptation is not a sin unless you enter into it. <laughs> unless you go cross from this reality of the house of God in the presence of God, however you want to say it, from this reality, and we step over the temptation, 
into another reality. We have to leave that reality behind to get to this reality. Now what happens? We have to get back. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, I've sinned. Oh, my God, I've sinned. I got a story shared just this week to the guy in town. This is shared this week. And, and all of a sudden, uh, I can't give you the details. I'm not going to give you the details. But anyway, this guy, long story short, the Spirit of the Lord come upon him. He said, oh, my God, I'm a sinner. Nobody preached to him. Nobody talking to him. All of a sudden, there was an awareness. Remember I talked about the awareness of the presence? Awareness came on this guy, and this guy began to cry out or repenting and so on and so, so forth. Obviously, there are people praying for that man's soul. I heard that story. I said, it's starting. I said, it starts today. I said, man, I'm praying. Let conviction like that fall on the city and let God restore all these things that have stepped over the threshold and stepped into an alternate reality that God never intended. The battles that he intends you to fight, he equips. The battles he intends you to fight, you can do nothing but win. Jehoshaphat, Joshua. I mean, I could name them. We go, David. I mean, he <laughs> got... Why? David, it was in impossible odds against Goliath. Impossible odds. But God isn't, God isn't a gambler. He doesn't go by odds. But when he empowered him, it was a battle David had to fight because God had equipped him to do it. Not with the equipment that man knows, but with the equipment of the heart, and he made him prevail. Everything else he needed in, a, in that conquest was provided for him by the enemy. To finish him off. Hallelujah. Holy smokes. What do, we, what do we stumble into here? Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Peace, when God talks about peace, when Paul talks about peace, peace is a felt awareness. It's a felt awareness. We know when we have peace and we know we have turmoil. So peace is a felt awareness. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I'm a, well, that's good, too. But, and I always over-prepare. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm going to, <laughs> there's a perception that comes when we begin to see what Jesus sees. There's a different perception that comes. Amen? But uh, prayer, but, uh, being I mentioned the word prayer, prayer is what keeps us, how can I say this? Uh, excuse me for just a minute. Prayer is what keeps us on the right side of the gate. Amen. Prayer is what keeps us going through the right gate. The correct gate. Amen. Amen. Prayer. Uh, prayer is, is both two, it's two things. It's a responsibility and it's a privilege. Amen. We think about easily repair, prayer for ourselves, but what about prayer for the people? Prayer for other people is a, God felt, uh, is a God prayer that can initiate blessings for us without even asking. I, I, I've heard this before. People have prayer lists and they have lists and things. Prayer. I, I generally don't. Um, I'm the old school. If you got 15 minutes to pray, that's all you got is 15 minutes to pray, I'll spend the first 12 minutes praising Him. Because without stepping into the presence of God, your prayer is going to be mundane, religious, uh, all about self. And it, but when I step in His presence, I go through the gate of heaven. Okay, I step in a different reality. I need to be in that reality to be effective in my prayer. Now, when I say effective, what, what do I mean by effective? Not just supporting myself and my own, uh, with, you know, my own and my own, but also reaching out and understanding the burdens of a city, burdens of a nation, world, and, and building off from there. Amen? Amen. Help anybody this morning? Yeah. Praise the Lord. That all started from the word gate. Physically, Nehemiah was building a gate. Nehemiah is one of my heroes in the Bible. I just love this guy. I just love him. I love him to death. I mean, he, what he did and how he stood. He stood feverishly at the work. And all he was doing was repairing the breaches that the enemy, uh, the Babylonians, had destroyed. But he was repairing the breaches that the Persians allowed them to go back in to do. And so, but then the last thing he had to do, listen to it. I should have put this in my notes, but I, I did it pretty good. The last thing he had to complete at the very last is when the enemy that came against Nehemiah had their greatest rigor. They, I mean, they were just angry. Do you know what it was? Do you know the last thing he had to do? Hang the gates on the city. 
when it came to hanging the gates on the city of Jerusalem, Nehemiah underwent his strongest attack, yet they threatened him. They tried to lure him away to kill him, even though he had legal rights to be there. Jesus Christ has given you legal rights to take the ground that you're standing on. But the enemy wants to lure you away, get you away from that place, get you through another gate of temptation where he can end it. That was good. Why didn't I put that in my notes? That was good. I'm glad I thought about it. Uh, the Lord, uh, but the, Nehemiah, if you look, you study, the whole book of Nehemiah is fantastic. But if you study the biggest battle he had, and he says, why should I come down? And I'm going to paraphrase. Why come out and commune with the likes of you? and leave the work of the Lord. Why should I do that? I won't do that. And then they send threatening letters. You better come here or this, that. Now, ignore them. I'm, I'm doing a good work here. God has ordained me, and we're going to finish this. It, when he came to the gates is when he went wild. They didn't mind the breaches in the wall. Well, they minded. They didn't want the city of Jerusalem to be built at all. But when he came to the gates, Nehemiah said, the last thing that had to be built, the last thing that went on for the finishing touches. Of, now, he only worked on the wall. Ezra and the group were work, already working on the temple, rebuilding after the Babylonians destroyed it. But when he came to the gates is when the enemy screams. Same thing today, metaphorically. When we start coming to the gates, the hanging on the gates of the Lord and the gates that he's going to, and start building ourselves up in prayer, all oh, the enemy has a, has a fit. He's trying to lure us out of that reality from behind this gate out into the reality. When we step out onto the streets of public, if I can use that analogy, then this is, where, this, this, is, this is it. This is what he wants us to do. Now he's, this is in control. Just like my backyard. Here, I am Lord. This is my property. And my wife will sit there and feed me grapes on the front lawn. No shit. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's not true. But this is my domain. But when I step out the gate, not so. I can't all of a sudden take a jackhammer. I don't like the sidewalk. I'll start chiseling up. And the cop will come with handcuffs. Destruction of city property. Why? Because this is a different reality. But they're both real. Both real. So which reality do you want to live in this morning? Praise the Lord. I'll make us some other word this morning. Hallelujah.